My name is Mary Jacobson. I'm the moderator of this session. So I'm happy to introduce Dr. Jared Younger. He's a PhD at Stanford in the Department of Anesthesia in the Division of Pain Management. He's going to talk today about chronic pain in women. All right. Thank you. OK, thank you. So I am a clinical pain researcher here at Stanford. So I spend all of my time trying to understand very complex pain disorders and trying to come up with new treatments for complex pain disorders. That's what my whole job is. So what I'm going to do today is talk about pain conditions and pain issues that are particularly relevant to women. I, I'm guessing some people probably in the audience have are dealing with chronic pain, and so a lot of you know someone with chronic pain. So I'm also going to try to get in some helpful tips and try to get you some information that may be helpful. So the first thing I want to say is that pain is not a bad thing. Pain is actually a good thing. It is an essential thing. If you did not have the ability to feel pain, you would have no way of knowing if something was going wrong in your body. You can live a full life, a long life, if you can't see, if you can't hear, if you can't taste or smell, but you can't live a full life if you can't feel pain. People who are born in the world without the ability to feel pain generally don't make it past the age of five. And even in the United States, with the best medical care possible, your chances of getting past the age of 25 are pretty slim. And the reason is because, you know, you putting your hand on a burner, you have no idea if you're injuring yourself. That one's obvious, but usually it's something more subtle. It's how do you know how much weight you're putting on your ankle? And if you're putting too much weight on your ankle, if you can't feel pain, how do you know when to stop bending your arms back if you don't feel pain? So people who feel no pain end up just destroying their body, and they have no idea they're doing it. So it's absolutely essential. Now, pain is usually a symptom. It's a sign that something is wrong. That's the way pain is supposed to work, and that's called nociceptive pain. So it drives you to do something to fix the problem. So an example is you've got some kind of diffuse general pain, a lot of pain in your stomach, so you go to your physician, so the pain prompts you to go to your physician. They find out that it's appendicitis, so they do a surgery or they fix that problem. The problem goes away, and then the pain goes away. That's how pain is supposed to work. It tells you that something is wrong. Unfortunately, that's not the only type of pain that exists. And so what we're really talking about are other types of pain, not proper pain. So this is an example of something that could lead to neuropathic pain. So we have nociceptive pain, which is normal, and then we have neuropathic pain. So an example is, this is uh, the torso of a woman facing uh, to the left. Um, you get chicken pox when you're young, which is caused by the varicella zoster virus. You get the chicken pox, they go away, and you feel better. Now what happens is that virus hides out next to your spinal cord, and it waits for your immune system to become suppressed. And when that happens, that virus will travel up your sensory nerve and will manifest as a rash somewhere on your body. And it's very painful. We call it shingles. And it has this burning pain quality. Now typically, that'll last for a couple weeks, and then the rash will go away, it will heal, and you'll feel better. But sometimes, after the rash goes away, the burning pain remains, and that's post-herpetic neuralgia. So the, the virus and the inflammatory response has damaged the pain neurons as that virus was traveling up your sensory nerve. And so now your system for telling you when something is wrong has been damaged. And so your nerves are sending all these pain impulses to your brain, even though there's nothing really wrong with your body. That's neuropathic pain. Very, very painful. So you can liken it to a car alarm that's going off for no reason. So a car alarm is supposed to tell you when somebody's breaking into your car when there's a problem. That's how it's supposed to work. Just yesterday, I walked out of my office and a guy's car alarm was going off, and he was pushing all the buttons on the controller. He turned the car on. Nothing would turn off that car alarm. It was going off even though there was no problem. That's like neuropathic pain, signaling something's wrong when, there nothing, when nothing is wrong. So we treat that differently. If it's no susceptive pain, all you have to do is fix the underlying problem, and the pain goes away. But if it's neuropathic pain, it's much more complicated. You have to try to dampen the nerve signals or block them 
or try to get in other signals that counteract the pain messages. So when I say chronic pain, which is what this talk is about, what I mean is pain that, of course, lasts a long time. There's some arbitrary time definitions of three months or six months, but it, it just has to be something that's going to be around for a long time. So three to six months is a pretty good indicator. So something more than a couple of weeks. The important thing here, though, is that chronic pain is pain that exists even though the original problem has gone away. So you have a surgery. They open you up. They close you back up. It heals. Your pain is supposed to go away eventually. If it doesn't, then you probably have some sort of chronic pain condition. Everything's fixed, but for some reason you still feel pain. That's what we're talking about. And also it has to be very significant. It has to diminish the quality of life. So chronic pain is when pain stops being a sign, it stops being a symptom, and it becomes the problem. When pain becomes the disease, then we consider it to be chronic pain. I talked about neuropathic pain. There's one other type of chronic pain syndrome that I want to mention, and that's central sensitivity. Central sensitivity is when the nerves in your body are probably functioning properly, but your brain and spinal cord are amplifying the messages, the pain messages coming in, and turning it into something that's extremely painful. So everything's fine with your body, but you hurt all over, and you're very sensitive to pressure, maybe sensitive to heat. Other symptoms are you may feel very tired and have some cognitive issues because the brain and spinal cord are amplifying everything that's coming in and turning it into pain. So the classic uh, central sensitivity syndrome is fibromyalgia. I'm just going to mention this briefly. This is about 5 million women in the United States with this. It happens, it's diagnosed 10 times. For every one man that's diagnosed, 10 women are diagnosed with this. Uh, a lot of musculoskeletal pain, sensitivity to pressure, like thumb pressure in different parts of the body, profound fatigue, problems sleeping, cognitive issues, very, very common disorder. It's also very controversial because there's so many things that look like fibromyalgia. This is just a partial list of diseases that mimic fibromyalgia. So there's no blood test for fibromyalgia. There's no clinical test at all, which means to get a diagnosis of fibromyalgia, the physician has to exclude everything else that could possibly be causing the symptoms. But the thing is, is it's very hard to do that because there's so many things to test that some people are given a diagnosis of fibromyalgia when actually there's something else wrong, and vice versa as well. So it's a very tough diagnosis, and a lot of people have that diagnosis. The other problem with it is it's an, it's an invisible illness. So there's no lab test. There's no scan that we can do to see fibromyalgia, which means we can only go off of what the patient is telling us, what you're saying. The problem is, is when you have... This is just a fact of the world we live in right now, unfortunately. When you have a condition that is invisible, can't be seen on scans, and it happens in women more than men, there is a portion of society and a portion of the medical community that will discount that uh, pain syndrome and say that it's not real. That's just the way it is right now. We're working on that. As we get more information showing things in the brain that suggest this is a legitimate physical disorder, we're hoping to change those opinions. So the, the problem is, on top of all this pain and fatigue that these people feel, you also may feel like you're having to battle the medical community to take you seriously. And that all is dependent on the center and the physician, the clinicians that you're seeing. Um, one of the toughest challenges for a patient going to a physician with a central sensitivity syndrome is, how do you present yourself? Are you going to buck up and look more healthy than you actually are because you want the physician to respect you and not think that you're whining or complaining? Well, if you do that, then they may think you're not in a lot of pain, so you won't get aggressive treatment. On the other hand, if you come in and legitimately show how much you're in pain, they may think, oh, it's complaining about everything, so this person's just a hypochondriac, or they're complaining, and they may not take you seriously. So there's this battle, which shouldn't be the case, with how am I supposed to interact with people, and what kind of face do I put on this, and, and how do I present? So it's unfortunate that invisible chronic syndromes have this kind of extra element of complexity to them. Um, this is a 2008 article when Lyrica was approved for fibromyalgia, Drug approved, is the disease real? So this controversy is still ongoing, unfortunately. 
And this is uh, just indication of kind of the, that false face that you have to put on. So getting into the other chronic pain disorders, it is just a fact that women are more prone to various chronic pain disorders than men are. Uh, this is a list right here of all the chronic pain disorders that women get more than men. And far right are the disorders that men get more than women. So you see that there's a lot of conditions that women are more prone to. Now, of course, things like endometriosis and osteoporosis, those are logical ones that affect women exclusively or much more than men. Uh, but there's a lot of other ones. Uh, migraines, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, temporomandibular joint disorders, uh, things like that occur in women more than men. I just wanted to point out as an example what I was saying about the medical community, parts of it not taking fibromyalgia seriously. You see all these uh, systems here. The last one is psychogenic, and they have fibromyalgia. And we know psychogenic means it's an emotional problem. It's, it's completely in your head. Uh, and this is a 2008 review article as well. So you can see that we're still working on getting this uh, legitimized. Other disorders that are more common in women than in men, this is a chronic regional pain syndrome. Very, very painful syndrome where someone's just walking around, totally healthy, trips and falls, you sprain your wrist, and then a couple weeks later, your whole arm turns red, inflamed. This can last for months or years, and it's so painful that you can't touch it with any clothes. Even blowing on it would feel like fire. Extremely painful and very tough to treat. This happens in women three times as much as in men. And you can see, I mean, it's, it's hard to see with the lighting, but it clearly is a physical disorder. And we're not sure why it happens in women more than men. Uh, this is just a sketch of the classic lupus rash, which happens in women 10 times as much as in men. And this causes all over body pain and fatigue, heat sensitivity. Rheumatoid arthritis happens in women three to four times than in men. Very clear to see that that's a, a physical disorder. Uh, multiple sclerosis is something that now happens in women, I think, four times as much as in men. And it's pain, fatigue, some cognitive issues and sensory issues. So we see all these conditions that have some overlap uh, that occur in women more than men. So the question is, why does this happen? Have we explained it? And we don't have a perfect answer right now, but we're getting closer to it. What I can say is, after dozens of years, maybe even 100 years of laboratory testing, we do know that women are more sensitive to pain than men. Um, if you give heat or cold or electrical or pressure, it takes less stimulus to cause pain in a woman versus a man. And also, they can tolerate less before, it, before they say, I can't do this anymore. Now, there's various reasons why that may be the case. And the difference is actually very, very small. It's not a huge difference. So that doesn't explain all these chronic pain disorders. What we think is happening is in a lot of cases, it's an interaction between hormones and the immune system. And women seem to be, and this is preliminary data, but women seem to be more prone to developing low levels of inflammation in the body and maybe also in the brain and spinal cord that amplify pain. And men have less, uh, of a, are less prone to that. The reason we think that's the case is because if you look at children, boys and girls have the same likelihood of developing a chronic pain disorder until they reach puberty. And then women become more likely to develop pain disorders. Uh, fibromyalgia is a disorder that happens in young girls, typically once they heat, uh, hit puberty. But there's a, there's a lot of other cases. Also, pregnancy or that postpartum period is a time when many chronic pain disorders are likely to happen. And also, exogenous hormones can cause increase in likelihood of carpal tunnel syndrome and other pain conditions. So some indications that it's hormonal. Now, if you went to a pain center, it's typically going to be called a pain management center. And that's because for most of these conditions, we do not have a cure yet, although we are working on it. So the goal here is twofold. One is to get the pain levels down to a tolerable degree. And the second one is to help the patient find ways to cope with the pain and to lead a productive and rewarding life despite the fact that they have pain. That's the goal of the pain management centers. These are some of the needs that come on board when 
a woman is faced with a chronic pain condition, when you're told you're going to be in pain for quite a while, this is unlikely to go away anytime soon, and there's, there's this kind of quest to adopt a new way of living, a new pace of life, and adjusting expectations. And that's a very hard mental shift to make, especially if you were extremely active, if you owned your own business, if you were doing a lot of things, and now you just can't physically do those things. There's a huge mental shift with changing how you structure your life because of the chronic pain. And I'm not going to go through all of these needs, but just a few of them. It seems to be very important that someone with chronic pain has a real diagnosis, um, something where you can say, OK, now here's the starting point. Now I know what this is, so now we can figure out what to do about it. And I've seen how traumatizing it is uh, for women when they've had a diagnosis for a few years, and then they come in to see a pain specialist, and they say, no, that's not what you have. You have this instead. It can be very traumatic as they try to adjust to, I thought I had this thing. Now, now what do I do? So diagnosis is very important. Of course, keeping the pain to a tolerable level support from different areas, but also this, you need support, but there's also this need not to be the sick person and to be strong and uh, to maintain a sense of dignity. So the, the problem with this is there's all these needs, but a lot of them conflict with each other. You need to be engaged with your family and friends, but also if you push yourself, it's going to make the pain worse. So there's a need to kind of retreat as well. So those can conflict. You need a diagnosis, but you don't want to be labeled. Uh, just a lot of these things conflict. So it's a very complex kind of minefield to navigate how to live your life once you're faced with chronic pain. All right, so some, uh, some practical tips. Now, this is something if you have chronic pain, you've probably already gone through most of this process, but we'll go through it real quick. The first thing if you're dealing with pain is to see your primary care physician because the, the first thing we want to do is make sure that it's not indicative of something very serious, an emergency, something that needs to be treated right away, or it's going to be a danger. So that's always the first step. Now, if that's not the case, you'll probably get referred to specialists. Could be a rheumatologist, could be a neurologist, depending on what your symptoms look like. If they have trouble diagnosing it, you may get referred to a pain specialist, and we have a, a pain management clinic here at Stanford, and these are people who day in, day out, diagnose and treat chronic pain disorders. There are some other options uh, that I want to mention. One is clinical trials. So um, you can sign up for trials that are testing new therapies for pain. There's pros and cons to that. The pro is you could get a drug before it's available mainstream. The con is you're trying something before it's available mainstream. But generally, they're pretty safe by the time they get to this stage. But there's still some risk to it. Um, some places to find clinical trials if you're in pain or, or know someone in pain. One is the government maintained clinicaltrials.gov, and they have a list of registered clinical trials. You can put in your symptoms and, or the name of your condition, and it can point you to some trials. A newer way of doing this is a, a company called researchmatch.org that I think is affiliated with Stanford, and they have a site where you put in your, your symptoms and you put in your demographic information, and then I put in my study, like if I have a new treatment study, I put in who I'm looking for. And if it finds a match, it'll send you an email and say, there's this study going on close to you that is treating people like you. But it won't tell me who you are. It won't, sorry, it won't say anything about you. So it's very anonymous. Once you get that email, then you can decide to ignore it. You know, you've read about the study or contact me or have your information sent to me. So it's a really cool way to connect. Uh, people who are looking for trials with people conducting trials. You can also, if you're looking for novel ways to treat pain, you can look at institution-specific sites. So this is a Stanford's community academic profile. So you can do Stanford, if you're in Google, Stanford, CAP. And then I just put in pain. I got 400 personnel hits in Stanford. Now, I didn't go through all of them to see if they're all legitimate. But clearly, there's a lot of people doing pain research just at Stanford alone. So that's a good site. And then you can also go to, you know, do Google Pain Stanford or other institutions. And you can bring up um, researchers' own website. So this is my website. Every researcher has their own website. And then you can see what they're working on and what they're doing. Let me check the time. All right, doing okay. So some real practical tips. 
you're going through the medical uh, system, you're doing that part of it, is there anything you can do yourself in the meantime? So it's hard to find universal tips because every chronic pain condition is probably gonna have its own set of things it's gonna respond to. But I try to come up with a few universal ones. The first thing I would suggest is to be your own scientist and track your symptoms every day. Um, the way you do this is, this is what I do with everyone. Any study that I conduct, the participants do this every day. They have a little handheld computer and they track their symptoms each day. And you can do that, you can also just write down a number. So pain from zero to 100, zero is no pain at all, 25 is mild, 50 is moderate, 75 is strong, 100 is unbearable. And you just write that number down at least once a day, maybe multiple times a day. And then you do that for two or three months and graph it, you can put it in Excel or something like that, and uh, take a look at what the patterns are. You might see something like this, which is just 60 every day. If you see that, then there's no point in doing the pain diary. There's not much information. But probably you're gonna see something more like this. You're gonna see days where your pain is off the charts, really bad, but you're also gonna see days where your pain was actually quite manageable. And this, if you see this, that's a very good thing because if you have even one day where your pain is manageable, that means it is possible for your body to give you that, that good state. So if you can do it once, that means there has to be a way where you can do that multiple times. The trick is figuring out the triggers that lead to the bad days and also the triggers that lead to the good days. And you can do that by not only tracking your pain, but tracking everything else you can think of that could be a predictor of a good or bad day. Um, menstrual stage, exercise, sleep quality, maybe even your diet. I mean, you can't track everything, so you just do a few at a time. You may find every time I exercise a little bit too much, two days later I have horrible pain for the next week. Or uh, every time I eat ginseng, the next day my pain goes away. I'm not suggesting ginseng, I'm just making up stuff. But um, it, it might help, I don't know. But you can start to see these patterns. So uh, be your own scientist. You're gonna either laugh or cry when I say this, because if you have chronic pain, you know that pain makes sleep very difficult. But it is, we know for sure that if you have a bad night's sleep, it's gonna make your pain worse the next day. So there's this vicious cycle, pain makes sleep difficult, but poor sleep makes pain worse. But I just want to mention here that if you're already working with your physician on the pain side, don't forget the sleep side and also talk to your physician about trying to find a way to improve your sleep. Because if you can't break through that cycle on the pain side, you may be able to get a foothold on the sleep side. Uh, you will probably, no matter where you go, you'll probably get the recommendation to do some exercise. The key here is to not get too enthusiastic and push yourself to the degree that it causes a flare in the symptoms, especially with something like fibromyalgia. So low level exercise, water, you know, swimming, water based exercise, yoga, uh, easy cycling, walking are kind of the things to get started with. And then even though these conditions are not psychological at their core, there are still many nodes in the brain, many places along that path that you can either amplify or dampen pain. Uh, many ways that we can use psychology to reduce pain. The, the trick here is that everyone responds to a different approach. So you have to find the one that works best for you. Some people work really well with distraction. So focusing on other people, focusing on a cause, focusing on something outside of you will work for some people and make the pain go away for the time being. Other people respond to kind of the opposite approach, uh, which is mindfulness meditation, uh, which I haven't used myself, but it's uh, kind of uh, embracing the pain, accepting it, putting it in context, and removing the, uh, the psychological distress associated with the pain because distress amplifies pain. So that's another approach. Some people respond very well to learning everything they can about the disorder, and that helps reduce the pain. Some people respond well to dissociative techniques like imagery, guided imagery, where you can imagine the pain going away, or hypnosis. About 20% of people can have excellent pain reduction with hypnosis. Some people would say even more than 20%. Uh, this is almost laughable, but really just recognizing that psychosocial stress 
causes brain states that amplify pain. And so reducing external sources of stress will help reduce pain. And then the social support network is very important. If it's hard to relate to friends and family because you have a condition they don't, finding a group of people who know exactly what you're going through can be tremendously helpful. And if there isn't a local group, uh, there are at least going to be internet groups. So probably local is better, but if you don't have that, you can go and find excellent internet groups, support groups. So this is the pain management uh, clinic or pain division at Stanford. What I want to say kind of in conclusion is I think there's a lot of good things coming around very soon. Uh, I think this idea of inflammation we're working on is going to help a lot of pain conditions once we figure out that more. I'm doing a lot of research looking for uh, blood tests for fibromyalgia and for chronic fatigue. I'm doing tests for new treatments, and these things are very promising. Um, so you can, uh, this email link, uh, we're changing it. This will be active in a couple of days, Friday. You could email me if you want, if you're interested in the trials. But the bottom line here is that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of scientists who are spending literally their life's work trying to cure chronic pain. So don't give up hope. We're working as hard and as fast as we can to get something out there. And so I hope we have some uh, new exciting treatments pretty soon. And uh, that's it. Here's some references for the pictures and some of the tables. So thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.